Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jermit Cowie, and welcome to this evening's Engineers Ireland event. I'm a member of Engineers Ireland's Mechanical and Manufacturing Division, a group which also has a joint mandate as the Institute of Mechanical Engineers, Republic of Ireland region. So a warm welcome to members of both of those organizations. Before we start this evening's event, just a few points of housekeeping. Please do not post questions to the chat function. Please post questions to the Q&A function on Zoom. Unfortunately, they may be missed if they go into the chat function. Our next event will be this group's AGM around May 25th. It is open to all members. New committee members are always welcome. It's a great opportunity for networking and for continuous professional development. So I strongly consider you, uh, strongly encourage you all to consider attending and joining the committee. And finally, for the start of the new season in September, the next event will be a virtual site visit to Lufthansa Technic in Shannon. Barry Lowe is organizing that event and you're all very welcome to join us online when that is scheduled in September. So now I will hand over to Professor Orla Feely for this evening's event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dermot, and thanks for all that you have done to bring this event together, uh, along with your colleagues in the Mechanical and Manufacturing Division and, of course, the IMECE Division in Ireland. And um, thanks to Maureen Niengas in, in Clyde Road, who's helped out with organising it, and, of course, thanks to our panellists. So we have uh, four very distinguished panellists who will be sharing three presentations between them. You'll see how that's going to work uh, over the course of the, the of proceedings. Um, then we'll have a round table where I'll put questions to the panellists and then finally we'll go and take the Q&A from the audience. So please do, if you have any questions or comments based on what you're hearing, please do uh, submit them in the Q&A box. So our first speaker then is uh, Leo Clancy, who, as you know, is an engineer, is CEO of Enterprise Ireland. Unfortunately, Leo was unable to join us this evening, but was very keen to be able to participate in some way. And so he has sent us this video that will now kick us off. So there you're going to play the video. Good evening, everyone. It's a privilege to be here today, albeit virtually, and I'm delighted to be invited to address your event. I'd like to recognize the members of the Mechanical and Manufacturing Division here tonight, and especially your chair and my colleague, Connor Sheehan. I'm delighted that you have great speakers for the event with Jerry Byrne, Andrew Lynch, and Patrick Downs, great leaders in their fields, and what I'm sure will be a very stimulating panel led by Professor Orla Feely. Manufacturing is a mainstay of the Irish economy and is thriving in recent times. The forecasts of its demise have been many, but Ireland has held its own. In my view, this is largely due to the innovative capabilities of the people who work in Irish manufacturing. In recognising this, it is important to note that the role of engineers is becoming more and more important in ensuring continued competitiveness. We have seen the price of raw materials and the cost of shipping rise dramatically in recent years. Never a good thing for an island nation on the northwest corner of Europe. Energy and other input costs are going up dramatically at present, putting pressure on margins. And Ireland is now firmly a mid to high cost economy in terms of labour. One could argue this represents a perfect storm across the economy and particularly for our Irish manufacturers. That is certainly true in the short term, but it is also true in many of the other locations that we compete with to a greater or lesser extent. However, Ireland competes for the long term. And we compete not only through cost advantage, but through intellectual capacity and strong business skills. These attributes can make a much higher marginal impact on competitiveness than minor and often fleeting cost advantage. Across Ireland, we see great companies continuing to invest, but doing so based on the capabilities of the workforce and the cluster of excellence that we have in our industry. One very clear example of this is the recent investment by Intel in what is now a true mega factory in Weekslip. This is a huge vote of confidence in Ireland. More quietly, we saw Vitalograph, an Irish medical devices company, announce 200 jobs in Clare and Limerick based on new projects that included transferring consumable manufacturing from Asia to Ireland. The capability to reimagine your supply chain and make the necessary processes available to do such things should never be underestimated as examples of innovation. 
Whether it's Intel or Vitalograph, engineers are at the heart of creating success for any manufacturing operation. And Irish engineers have always been of highest calibre, with a hunger not just to do the job, but to innovate and further develop the processes they are entrusted with. That innovation will be required more and more as we develop our industrial base. The connection between product innovation and manufacturing innovation is getting closer and closer, and Ireland is fortunate to have both competencies in abundance, supported by an excellent teaching and research resource, and an attractive proposition for global talent to move here. Wherever your discussions lead tonight, I'm firmly of the view that Irish engineers will be at the heart of manufacturing innovation globally, as well as here in Ireland. And I know we have some of the best in the world. Thanks once again for inviting me to speak, and I wish you a very successful evening. That's great, and, and, and thanks very much to Leo for those words, who, who, and I think he introduced there a few themes that we're going to pick up on over the course of the evening, supply chain pressures, cost pressures, and also our dependence on talent, and, and our dependence, of course, on engineering. So a number of, of themes there that, like I say, we'll be elaborating on maybe by our speakers individually and certainly on the round table. So I'll now hand over to the first of our speakers who is Pat Downs. Pat is the Business Development and Innovation Manager in Design Pro Automation. He is a Bachelor of Engineering focused on Mechanical Engineering from the Institute of Technology Sligo. And uh, he has uh, 17 years experience of working as a toolmaker, Senior Mechanical Design Engineer and as an Engineering Manager across a wide, across a wide range of mechanical and industrial engineering industries. So Patrick, I'll hand over to you now. Thanks very much, Orla. Um, I'll just share my screen. I have a presentation. Can you see that? Okay. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all here today. Um, my name is Patrick Downs. Uh, as I already explained, I'm the Business and um, Development and Innovation Manager with Design Pro Automation. Um, we're a company based in, in Rakeel in County Limerick. Um, so what I'd like to speak to you today is just a bit of an introduction about who we are and the industry challenges that we're facing, um, some manufacturing technologies that we've implemented on some of our machines, the future automation uh, where we're investing into um, and to, to, to supply out to our customers and a couple of questions and answers after us. Um, as Orla explained, I don't need to, to read this again. Um, this is just a bit of my background. Um, I'm just going to play a video here. Um, it just shows our facilities. Um, and what you see is we have a, we have a 55,000 square foot facility. Um, we deal a lot with medical and automotive companies. Um, we have 50 plus employees now. Um, we, we basically provide a turnkey solution for for equipment. Um, I, I tend to stay away that we are, we're not equipment builders, but we're automation solution providers. And when I say that is we, what we do is we, we, we tend to walk through the process with, with, with our customers and it leads to better, better projects, um, more successful projects. Um, so we, we take a collaborative approach and we've developed a process over, over 17, 18 years where we get the engineer who knows the product better than anyone else to actually engage. And when we start to design around their product, they give us the tips, the handling, the issues, the, the little um, things that you pick up around the product from handling it every day. Um, and that, that's, that's, that's where it, it has proved successful in the last couple of years. Um, so just, just to show you where we are. So we're, we're a multinational company. We deal a lot with sister companies through the Ireland bases um, in China, in Mexico, uh, Czech Republic, Germany, we've supplied machines into, um, with 14 in-house departments where ISO accredited and so on. Um, you can see there, we're working with eight of the, top, of the world's top 10 medical device manufacturers. Um, and there's just some of the companies in that we deal with. I suppose um, what I'd like to talk to you today about is industry challenges and what we're seeing. Um, and we've recognized these, these five factors. Now we could, we could make the list 10 times longer, but 
Um, it was about only 15 minutes. I started to just refocus on the five key issues that we're seeing. Um, you probably see from a list of one to five. So the first one is product design for manufacturer. And when I say that, um, a lot of the products that we're seeing lately is, um, I suppose, how would you describe them? They're, they're complex. Um, they're more, uh, I suppose, space age materials. They're hard to handle. Um, a big factor that we would like to see is actually earlier engagement onto product design, which manufacturing engineers and industrial engineers, because getting a product out for production from an initial design concepts, um, there's a lot of a lot of money invested in it. And what we see is that we could bring a lot to the table early days on just on, on the product design, how we shape it, how we configure it, how it comes to to the to 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 the floor, how to handle it. Um, it, it it'll pay off in the long run and um, just early engagement. Um, recognizing proof of principle um, uh, high risk areas in as well on products early. They could be designed all of it before it goes to the course production. Um, number two, I put down is connectivity issues. Um, when we're seeing it, there's, there's a bit of a disconnect between um, machines now that we deliver and actually getting them onto their network. So all our machines now are getting all smarter, our devices are getting smarter. Um, so we have lots of data and now critical parameters and that we could offload uh, and pass on to our network. And what we're seeing is that a lot of firewall and security issues are popping up now, and we have to do workarounds on the machines to get in. So we, we put in SIM cards, and we put in modems and routers in order to flick a switch, and then we can gain access to support online globally. Um, but we feel that there's a bit of a disconnect between the, the connectivity integration of equipment into, into companies. Um, so that was just one of the, the issues that we're seeing. Um, another thing is obviously it's it's affecting everyone is product um, project lead times and delivery. Um, so everything basically with silicon chip now, electrical items, PLC controllers, safety cards, server motors, and um, they're all being pushed out. And we're getting crazy lead times at the moment on on, on devices, and obviously that passes on into our customers. Um, so the demand is outweighing the supply. So that is a huge key issue at the moment. Um, it's just that if, if engineers, I suppose, would know um, the lead times they could plan. So like a 12 week project could now become a 40 week project. Um, so I think they have to change now to suit the actual delays and, and supply of products, um, which is unheard of, but it's between COVID and obviously economic factors as well. Um, I think this is affecting affecting uh, manufacturing. Um, I hate saying it as well, on my fourth point as well, but engineers are actually a challenge as well. And I can explain why um, engagement is a big one. Um, engineers are busy and they run multiple projects and we understand that. Um, so we've, we've tried to develop different solutions to, in order to help them to gather information for us to have a successful project. So we've come up with um, a feed is what we call it. We call it front-end engineering design. Um, where we would go on site and basically liaise with the, with the engineer, gather the information, write it down and create a user requirement specification. Um, that helps obviously to get everything down on paper and get, get a, I suppose, a clear contract between us and, and the, the customer. Um, again, I mentioned proof of principle, um, working with the engineer and trying to get the, the high risk areas out that we can offer proof of principle or proof of concepts and uh, do a bit of research and development uh, using in-house equipment that we have and we can we can prove out if we can do it or not rather than investing a lot of money into the project it would only be time and equipment that we'd have to pump in at the very start and it would lead to a better project on the latter stages because you have a lot of it debugged and de-risked um, access to experienced engineers as well it's 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 an employees market at the moment. There's a lot of senior engineers jumping ship, and there's a lot of um, I suppose junior engineers who have started being handed big projects, and to 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 get them to to engage. And obviously, we bring a bit of experience to the table. We take them along that journey then with us. Um, I just think that if there was a bit of more I suppose passing out of the book 
or less less of passing on of the book um, with more support from senior engineers, it would lead to, to I suppose, better projects as well. Um, what we've developed as well is actually a continuous um, review cloud-based system. So as we develop out our projects, we create 3D models and so on, and we share this with our customers. Um, they're invited into this uh, platform and they can engage with our design team or automation team as the project develops. And we find that, again, their input is, is valuable because they know their products better than anyone else. Um, big thing as well, and we're seeing as well as my last point is actually CE marketing, uh, sorry, safety. And, and what we're seeing is that a lot of machines are taken in from the Far East, but also in the, in the European Union. And their understanding of the European Machine Directive is it's basically um, it's, it's, it's a person's perception. So we provide risk analysis and um, we have a, a, a later CE marketing software and we do risk, risk analysis on the high risk areas and so on. And we can send over the equipment that we, that we, that we buy in we supply sorry and the equipment that's been bought in we've actually been brought in on a number of occasions to to pay uh, sorry to to fix the machines to bring it up to, to european machine directive standards and the problem is the machine is coming in possibly at a lower cost base but by the time all the the, the safeties are added it actually brings the cost up so we're just seeing that a lot lately as well um i think COVID has changed that a small bit in that a lot of companies now are starting to look locally, whereas before they were looking looking um, outside of Ireland. Um, manufacturing technology. So I'll just show you some of the some of the, the equipment that we have supplied in. Um, uh, IO Link now is, is is a big thing. A lot of our devices now are are connected to the internet. They're web based. Um, they're coming in with more data and more configurations than ever before. And we can program, uh, for instance, a sensor to have five different functions. Um, whereas previously you had a sensor and the sensor would just detect on off. Whereas now we can actually program it to do light on, light off, dark on, dark off, um, background suppression, different different various um, setups on the one sensor. And the, the, the IO link well is useful that if that sensor ever breaks down, you can change it out. And the program is already there and it uploads the, the previous settings to it. And it's also, you can log in through your phone now as well on some devices and as well. Um, we've implemented single cable technology. So um, a lot of motors, server motors, um, 240 volt motors, they were coming in with a resolver and a power cable. They're now being supplied with single cable. It reduces down wiring, it reduces down uh, panel space. Um, less things that can go wrong on a machine. Um, another thing we've introduced is, is vision systems. So we've put in smart cameras. Uh, I mentioned Gigi cameras there as well. Um, a lot of companies now want to, to validate with the human eye. Um, but now we have cameras that we can put multiple cameras on one platform and you can pick up various defects and so on. Uh, energy saving is a big one we're seeing. Um, for instance, we've been requested for a fully electric machine. Um, so they had done studies, pneumatics versus electrical, and it showed that having a fully electric machine was more cost effective, their return on investment was better, their load monitoring, their, their um, consumption of energy in the company was far less with a fully electric machine. Again, we've looked at some of the devices within the machine, we tend to try and put in 24 volt um, devices, which with low ampage, LED lights, um, as well, it's, it's, it's not something that's factored into return on investment side or on the actual running of the machine. So you can, you can build a machine that's very complex, um, but uh, and the price could be cost effective, but running it after could be very expensive. Um, so that's one thing that we're starting to see more and more is synergy efficiency. Um, preventive maintenance is another thing. As I mentioned, all the devices are getting smarter. They're all kind of web-based. Um, we can now put in conditional monitoring on, on, on equipment. So if a motor is moving A to B and it's lifting a load, we can actually monitor the, the threshold on the motor that if it starts to deteriorate over time, we can get signals back and use that data then to actually throw up alarms and also for preventive maintenance. Um, what we start to do as well, you probably see the last points there is pack and mill. 
So if you standardize program format, well, what we tend to see in the past was you're reliant on someone's, um, I suppose, you can write a code a hundred different ways for controlling a machine through the PLC, but using this platform metal structure, um, what we've created is basically a library that if any engineer, automation engineer can log in and understand the code quickly by using the state algorithms in, in the actual packer metal coding. And um, that's, that's another thing that has been coming up lately. Future automation, and I suppose what we're investing in and what we're looking at um, in order to, to bring our machines to the next stage is, I mentioned a, a logo line here of smart devices and smart engineers. So the engineer has kind of changed from uh, the nuts and bolts to a lot of it is data integration and communication between different devices. So I mentioned everything is web-based, you know, coming in with more data um, and are more readily available. So our engineers need to move with that. Um, one thing as well that we started to supply is actually VR headsets. Um, so our next step, stage that we're looking at is supplying the operations manuals, the drawings, the, the troubleshooting, all within the headset. So when the machine ever breaks down or they're doing preventive maintenance, they stick on the headset and they can go through each one of the items visually as they're working on the machine. Another good thing is that we can dial into the machine through the eyes of the engineer globally, and we can actually direct and train the operator to debug the machine, to get it back up and running and get production going again. Um, I mentioned Industry 4.0 and Digital Twins, and I know Industry 5.0 has been mentioned. Um, well, Industry 4.0 to us is, 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 is Internet of Things, and I know I mentioned Internet of Things, but what we've looked at is we've looked at putting a master PLC where we can control multiple machines off that PLC, cloud-based. Um, so that's, that's something we are looking at. Vision systems are now coming in with AI, artificial intelligence, where um, they can pick up on products and they will train them themselves to basically pick up defects, but it does it over time. So it picks up on differential changes on the product and then through an algorithm then works out what is the change and if that is a fail or a pass. And so we've started implementing um, some of those vision systems and we have them in our, our R&D lab. Um, I mentioned the VR and the AR again, we're starting to do our presentations and our 3D modeling to our customers. They come to our site, we put on, they put on a headset and they can actually walk around the machine. They can check it for ergonomics. They can check where the material handling, the material loading. They can check where the product comes out. They can visually check the aesthetics. Um, it's proven, proven very successful in finding issues. Um, so that, that, that's a great um, addition that we're finding. App-based um, PLC and robotic programming. Again, I mentioned that earlier. Um, everything now is like it's got to be like your mobile phone. You can drag and drop apps and you can program robots. Bosch are bringing out a PLC now that is going to be multi platformed. So if you are a Siemens programmer, an Ellen Bradley programmer, a Bechoff programmer, they all use different coding um, methods. Bosch are actually bringing out a platform now that they can drop in an app and you can write it in your Siemens logic, you can write it in your Bechoff, or you could write it in your Alan Bradley. So that's, that's really exciting because before we were tend to always be stuck to, oh, you have to use Alan Bradley, you have to use Bechoff, the structured text. But now there's products coming out where it allows us to put multi-platforms on that one PLC. And, and lastly, as I said, I mentioned just wireless controller and devices. So a lot of times if we're dealing with robotics, we have cables and they're coming off the head of the robots and they're coming down the arms. Um, they tend to go over time because they're flexing, they're moving. And uh, wireless controllers are now there where they're using Bluetooth and they can wirelessly go back to a master. So there's a master and a slave. The slave will be mounted on the robot head. Um, and then your, 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 your master thing is within your panel. And you can fire cylinders, uh, pick up on IO and, and sensors and stuff for opening and closing. So that's exciting to see that they are looking at, at wireless um, controllers as well. Um, and I'd like to thank you for your time. And I'd like to, to hand back over to Orla. And um, thank you very Thanks. much.
Thanks very much, Patrick. And I think you outlined there very well a lot of the opportunities and some of the challenges that we're facing associated in particular with the digitalization of manufacturing. So that's certainly something that we're going to pick up in the uh, round table. And again, if any of you have any specific questions based on what Patrick uh, described there, please put them in the Q&A box. So next up is Dr. Andrew Lynch, who's the Chief Innovation Officer with Irish Manufacturing Research. He's also the Vice President of the Eureka Smart Platform and National Delegate to the European Manu Future High Level Group. Andrew's on the EFRA Made in Europe Partnership Group, the Board of the Irish Advanced Manufacturing Training Centre of Excellence, Amtech, and the Future Cast Construction Centre. So Andrew, I'll hand over to you now. That's great. Thank you, Orla, for that. Can you see my screen just to confirm here? You can, yes. Yes, you can. All right, very good. Thank you all for that kind introduction. As my mother said, if I didn't know me, I'd be very impressed. Uh, I am the Chief Innovation Officer with Irish Manufacturing Research. It's the largest engaged manufacturing research network in the state. We're an independent not-for-profit RTO. So it's wonderful to be asked to speak here. Thank you, Orla, and all of the team in Engineers Ireland, Connor Sheehan in particular, from Enterprise Ireland for the kind invite. And what I'd like to focus on tonight as my uh, little contribution to this is uh, an, a focus on the role of the human. What's the future of manufacturing work in a knowledge economy? And I'm very conscious that when we normally talk about the economy we're in, it's an industrial economy. You talk about Industry 4.0, and as Patrick mentioned earlier on, Industry 5.0 in some places, which sounds like another execution level altogether. But of course, what we're really talking about is next generation manufacturing. And this is an opportunity really to take all of these wonderful technologies that you can see here on the screen, many of which are coming to fruition around about now, around about the same time. And it's having a massive impact on our ability to deliver this thing called next generation manufacturing. Manufacturing. But of course, when you look at uh, a model that I've just shown here, one of the things that's of course missing is the next generation, these lovely selfie taking Instagram loving young people, many of whom are on the call tonight. And I know that you're eating your, your dinner and your supper while you're looking at me and wondering, why should I get involved in manufacturing? Why should I get involved in this engineering role? And I'm an engineer now, where am I going to take my career? What am I going to do? And I would always put my hand up in terms of manufacturing, because if, if you think from a historical perspective, in 100 years time, they're going to look back at these 10 years and say, wow, this was the part in history where manufacturing changed forever. And I can promise you it's a good change. It's not constituted as we normally see around this idea of robots. The robots are coming to take our jobs. And it's very hard as a young person to counter this type of philosophy. And I want to just engage with this a little bit more if I can, as part of my own contribution to this night's discussion. And very often when we think about automation or technologies in any sense, we have this idea that it replaces the human being. And you can see here on screen on the left hand side in black and white all these jobs that people had in a pick and place sort of an environment where you take it from A and put it to B and so on. And then you fast forward 100 years, you look on the right hand side and you see all of these lovely robots, these shiny robots doing this work in a way that doesn't require any human input whatsoever. And it's very easy to draw the conclusion from A to B and assume that two plus two equals five. But I just want to delve into that in, in a slightly different way. Supposing we consider the ATM. Now, the ATM hasn't been with us for, for that long, the automated teller machine and the idea that you stick a card on the wall, press some buttons and your money comes out. I was in New York City in 1986 watching this happen and I was astounded. And of course, now it's everyday life for all of us. So when those ATMs came into banks, that meant that all the tellers that worked in those banks were immediately made unemployment, unemployed and there was a huge surge in bankers' unemployment rates which of course did not happen over the following 30 years, it actually tripled in the number of people that are employed directly by banks because those tellers, instead of using their time to count out your money, which didn't pay very well, what they used their time for then with, with the banks themselves was to talk to you about much higher value products for the banks themselves, things like mortgages and credit cards and car loans and all these things. And what actually happened was the cost of opening a bank 
in a location actually went very, very low, comparatively speaking, which meant it proliferated the number of banks that were out there, which of course, in turn, uh, made sure that we had an awful lot more employment for those kind of banks. So what does the human being bring to this technological revolution? And of course, you know, if all of our technology is running really, really well, the part that the human is responsible ultimately will become that piece, the vital cog, if you like, in any industrial setting. And of of course, what we bring to this is concepts like innovation and this idea of robust thinking. If you listen to Margaret Heffernan and some of her speeches on, on YouTube, for example, she talks about, you know, this idea that we are now creating uh, vaccines for viruses that don't exist. And this idea is this type of ideation comes very much from a human psyche perspective. But we do know that machines are catching up. And I think this is always a dichotomy that we have as a member of the human race. I remember sitting with my dad in 1997 and watching Gary Karskoff lose to Big Blue after 17 moves. It was shocking. And of course, this was the idea that IBM had built a supercomputer that could beat the world champion in chess. But of course, what they had done was they looked at all of the finite possibilities that Karkovs could have taken, and they built strategies against that, and they eventually beat him. What's even more impressive is over the last number of years, Google have set up this AlphaGo team, and AlphaGo set about beating the world Chinese game of Go champion. And Go is a very different game to chess in terms of how it's structured. It's much more intuitive. In fact, after only six moves, the number of potential moves thereafter is more than the atoms in the known universe. In other words, it's infinite. So now you have a computer which is, uh, if you like, ideating and building and learning very like a human intuition. So again, as a human being, you're looking at this and saying, well, am I really like the horse from 150 years ago? 100 plus years ago, there was over a million horses in Ireland. Now there's only a couple of thousand of them there, play things for, for very wealthy people. But this is a change that we've seen coming down the line. And one of the really interesting ideas that, that I think we could look back into history of, this idea that came from uh, David Slouse in the 1870s. He was a, a British economist who was looking at this idea of the new technologies for his time coming into being. And he was in a dockyard one day and he was looking at this gentleman who was working on one of these presses, these hand presses that was belting out little washers. And the guy in the press was very depressed. And when he had a conversation with him, what he realized the guy was saying was that my friends, my family, my neighbors, they no longer have jobs because I'm operating this press. I'm doing OK. But most of these people will not have work and it will really, really impact their families. They could die. And what Slouse proved over a period of years that this wasn't actually the case. Because now, due to that automation of its day or that technology of its day, the cost of making that particular washer plummeted. And organizations and companies that wouldn't normally use that washer now consider that washer. Ergo, there was a, a drive on people looking for that washer. Therefore, the organization had to put more of these presses in. And what you have all these people uh, current, or at that point in time now employed gainfully, albeit creating far more value for the organization itself. In fact, if we consider this at a macroeconomic level, it's really interesting as well. If you do a very simple maths uh, um, exercise from 100 years ago, and you take the GDP of every country on planet Earth at the time, and divide it by the number of people on planet Earth at the time, what you'll find is a number equating to almost $100 per year. And what that means is that almost everyone at that time was on or below the poverty line. Now, if you repeat that exercise in today's world, what you'll find is 100 years later, dividing the GDPs of all the countries in the world and divided by the number of people on the planet, even though that number has grown substantially, what you'll find is that the resultant number is equal to about $16,000 a year. In other words, the idea that we bring technology into an environment and that it transforms that environment will get rid of all of the work that's there is simply not the case either at at a macro or a microeconomic level. And all of those changes have been occurring over generations, really. 150 years ago, we, we, if we said to someone 150 years ago on an agricultural farm in Kerry that 150 years from now, less than 96% of the people who are currently employed in farming would be employed there now, that farmer would think that, my God, there must be in a famine or a war or something going on, because he wouldn't have been able to understand the need for something like a hot yoga instructor or a 
or a software developer, and even in my own case, a chief, a chief environmental officer. And the idea that we have all of these types of technologies now is something that he couldn't fathom. So we've grown over that period of time. In fact, by the 1950s, we had most of those people working in factories. And even between the 1950s and 2016 in the first world, we've seen 75% of those people transfer directly into offices. And we could see that in most of our manufacturing facilities around the country, large or small at that point, the need for support staff that's coming into this environment is very, very significant. The challenge for the worker and the challenge for the person at the core of all of this is, of course, that previously when this happened over generations, whereas now it's happening over a period of a few short years. So again, at a macro level, we need people in our manufacturing facilities, but it's almost something that owner managers say to me a lot. I need different types of people that are coming into my business. And one of the things that I wanted to talk about tonight was this idea of Sisyphus. So Sisyphus was a Greek mythology uh, character, fascinating guy. He upset the gods and the gods set about punishing him. And the gods could have punished him in almost any way. They could have him hung, drawn, quartered. They could have him shot, beheaded. They could have him crucified, for example. But what they did was they got him to roll a rock to the top of a hill, watch it roll to the bottom, and again get to do it all over again for eternity. And the real question we need to ask ourselves as an engineering community in this country and beyond is how many of our fellow human beings and our colleagues are working in roles in our organizations right now that are Sisyphean in principle. And the opportunity that all of these technologies that Patrick was talking about earlier on and that we'll hear subsequently tonight, all of these technologies, what they're really doing is they're presenting an opportunity to get rid of some of the tasks that we're faced with and not getting rid of the occupations themselves. If we consider, for example, the role of a doctor 200 years ago versus a doctor today, the occupation is still there, albeit transformed. And we must assume that in 200 years from now, it will be transformed again. The idea isn't that man gets beaten by a machine or vice versa, that the idea is that a man and a machine will beat any all, and all comers that come to it. The opportunity that we can transform the human experience, the idea that the role that the human has vital across this implementation of technology is something that's being transformed by this transition. This transition, as we said, from this idea of an industrial revolution based economy to more of a knowledge economy where the human being is being moved into quite a different role. And actually, again, going back to my uh, going back to my economists, we're moving a little bit away from the Adam Smith model, which was so prevalent in, in Ford's type of philosophy. And we're moving, believe it or not, almost to a Karl Marxian type uh, model here, because we're looking at this idea that the human endeavor within this context is something that needs to be cherished and grown and will add far more value in the long run, both for the organization and for the companies themselves. Just keeping an eye on my time here, I have a couple of more slides. So one of the things in terms of a global trend within which all of this occurs, whether it's technology or human and all of that human in the loop uptake, one of the things that we know is that in the future, in the next five years or 10 years, if your organization isn't digital, if it isn't green, if it isn't resilient, then it won't exist. And this is not just an Irish problem, this is an international problem. We know that America is dealing with this by focusing on IP. We know that China, for example, is dealing with this by moving itself up the value chain from a quality perspective and actually spending more money on automation than any other nation on earth. We look at Europe, for example, the context that we have in Europe is this idea of accentuating the human experience, this idea of safety, this idea of green, for example, is being led globally by the European Union, but, the, but we need also to create that excellence in terms of our transformation of our organizations. And again, Ireland has a huge amount, as we see, uh, as, as we saw Leo Clancy say earlier on, this idea that we've got excellence in our engineers, excellence in our industry partners, excellence in the support networks that we have there. And again, this research ecosystem that's hugely beneficial for organizations as they, as they take this journey. And one of the things that companies struggle with is what should I actually do? Is it focus on my people, on a particular technology, on a particular transition and so on? Because there's so many options for organizations nowadays, it's important that they take the right 
step from what it is they do. And part of what we do in the IMR is this idea of demystify, de-risk and deliver. We take away all of the unknowns in terms of what these technologies can and cannot do. And then we trial it with the organizations themselves so that there's no risk into it. And then at the high TRL level or that execution level of excellent research into a commercial setting, we deliver that. And one of the nice uh, areas that we, uh, we can get people engaged with us is this idea of Siri, the smart industry readiness index. This is the World Economic Forum International Standard for Implementation of Industry 4.0. And the really good news is that Enterprise Ireland, through their digitization voucher, actually pay for this for organizations to get involved. And you can see here one SME, as they said, I, I really like this quote, very impactful for us in SME with limited resources. We now have a targeted direction. We know what we need to do, and we have a plan of action to achieve it. There's no reason why any organization in this country couldn't engage with that as a first step to actually understand where I sit in this ecosystem, what the opportunity is for me, and not just in my technologies, not just in my resources, not just in my supply chain, not just in digital trends and any of the technologies, but the people that are coming with me on this journey because they are pivotal to the success of my organization. My name is Andrew Lynch. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer with Irish Manufacturing Research, and I think I'm three minutes within my time. So thank you, Orla, for the opportunity, and I will stop sharing. <laughs> Thanks very much, Andrew. And again, in the round table, we'll pick up on a few of the themes that you brought up there, particularly that huge overarching theme of talent and where we are in terms of the provision of talent in this very changed environment. You mentioned also the green agenda, the sustainability imperative will certainly be touching on that. So now, and I see he's got his slides up there already, uh, we, we've got a shared presentation from Jerry Byrne and Joe Purcell. Jerry Byrne, as you will all know, somebody who needs no introduction to, to, to a group like this, one of Ireland's most senior international chartered engineers. Again, those of us in Engineers Ireland know him as a former president, also a former Dean of Engineering in UCD, um, senior advisor to the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft and the chief scientific officer of ReadyWatch, limited to doing a lot of work at the moment on the management of R&D in industry. So his is going to be a joint presentation with Joe Purcell, who's the CEO and Chief Technical Officer and Executive Director of Mincon Group PLC, and Joe's extensive experience in manufacturing methods, heat treatment and process development. So Jerry, I'll hand over to you and then you'll hand over to Joe. Okay, Orla, th thank you very much for the introduction. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I, I believe that it is really timely, very timely to have this round table discussion on this important topic of ordi and i in manufacturing. And you see here the ambitious title uh, that we put on this uh, presentation. Uh, I, as Orla said, I'm the chief scientific officer of a company called ReadyWatch Limited. Uh, and uh, that's the, this company here. And uh, what we do actually is we deliver expertise and capability in ordi and i to companies but in a digital manner. Uh, so we use our, our own newly developed software tools to support the achievement of best international practice in ordi and i in our client companies and organizations. So in this very short uh, two-part talk, uh, where to next for ordi and i in manufacturing, myself and Joe Purcell, the CEO of Mincon PLC, uh, that's a, a global engineering company specializing in rock drilling. Uh, we're presenting uh, this case study here tonight. Uh, so um, in this next slide, we've heard industry 4.0 and 5.0, uh, and I'm using this one here as well. Uh, I just kind of like this slide. It's, uh, it shows historical transitions uh, across the different industrial revolutions. Uh, and uh, I think if you note on the y-axis here, on the right side, the degrees of complexity uh, the color dots there, uh, they, uh, you see that it's a non-linear scale of complexity. And uh, I think complexity is really a central theme for us uh, as we progress now into the future. Uh, I think we all know that we are truly in a stage of massive societal uh, and industrial transformation. And indeed, I, I would even, you know, when you hear see the difficulties that we're having with supply chains, I would even say turbulence. We're in a stage of turbulence at the moment. Uh, we do know that the Earth's average temperature has risen by 1.1 degrees centigrade compared, compared to the pre-industrial era. Uh, and we're rapidly approaching. The World Meteorological Organization yesterday reported we're tipping in and out of the, of the 1.5 degrees as we stand or you know, in the very near future. So there's a serious uh, challenge uh, with, I suppose, a, a very hard line limit, uh, 1.5 degrees 
an absolute worst case scenario of, of two degrees. So uh, decisive action is needed uh, to bring this situation under control. And uh, is it fair to say that it's not under control? So uh, I'm going to make eight points in my presentation. This is the first point is uh, that the sustainability targets as legislated for, they do represent perhaps the greatest challenge of the 21st century. Uh, interesting when you look more closely, uh, never before, I think, during the course of this journey across the various industrial revolutions, have we had uh, absolutely specific numbers. Uh, so other uh, industry, one, two, three, uh, four, uh, the specific numbers weren't present, but now we're working to very specific targets. Uh, and as well as my second main point then is that because of these very specific targets, new demands and approaches to technology development are emerging. So this will have an influence on technology development. Uh, and that will they will be different to those of the past. And I think we have to adopt to this new situation. Um, it is now clear and generally widely accepted so that it is really not business as usual. Uh, and uh, so my third point is that, uh, an indicator on this slide, uh, uh, we, re we urgently need this step change in innovation capability in this country. Uh, and we need new models of innovation to meet legally binding targets and the changing customer expectations and demands that we have going forward. And uh, we as engineers, we have very sig significant societal responsibilities uh, here. Uh, we know that the roadmap for this achievement, uh, for the achievement of a step change in innovation, the roadmap currently is immature, uh, it's actually diffuse, and indeed it's very difficult to formulate this, this roadmap. So it is a complex in nature and will be challenging for us to implement but we must get there. And so the old non-digitalized models of innovation are out of date. We need new models and these should be built within an overall framework uh, of the relatively new innovation management standard, the ISO 56002, which was, was uh, published in 2019. Uh, and these models then, they must be integrated through digitalization uh, and new software tools are needed to support this. And as we will see uh, from uh, MinCon, Mincon uh, later on, uh, this case study shows considerable progress in this direction. Uh, just staying with this step change for, for a moment, uh, another aspect that is emerging, and this is uh, my fourth main point, that the traditional meaning and definitions of value creation and also a business success in companies, are they, are they still valid or are they no longer valid? The CTO of BASF recently presented the case, made the case that there are no longer valid value creation and business models. It's not the same as, as it was in the past. So uh, the impacts uh, on business plan development of companies and on enterprise strategic planning processes, these are hugely important issues and ones that we need to focus, uh, come in, uh, let come into focus for us to develop our companies uh, going forward. Uh, just let me mention uh, core technologies and international best practice. And by definition, the fundamental role of R&D is to create new knowledge as seen from a global perspective and is specifically related to the core technologies of companies. Uh, there is an increasing necessity to place uh, a, a stronger focus on core technology development of the companies and to lifting the international body of knowledge in the company's core technologies through high quality R&D and I programs. And partnerships with national, but also very important with the international ecosystems for ORD and I is absolutely vital here. And MinCon have already identified this and are progressing their core technologies, as we will shortly hear, uh, with very close relationships with our customers and then with the ORD and I ecosystems, for example, through their work with the SFI iForm Center and also through a recent award of an Enterprise Ireland DTIF funded project in micropiling and in offshore uh, applications. So um, my fifth point is that the topic of global best practice in ordi and I in industry, it is an absolutely central theme for us going forward. Uh, and we need to turn, I believe, we need to turn the dial up in this regard and to move more forcefully to continue to build uh, an even more internationally connected, integrated ordi and I ecosystem based out of Ireland. Uh, MinCon is on this, this journey to implement global best practice. My, my sixth point, uh, and before I finish, uh, just a brief comment uh, on technology uh, transfer. transfer. 
And we believe that the conversation and the nature of interactions between industry, RTOs and the universities and the funders of uh, research, because of the implications of what I'm saying, it has to be different going forward. It's not, it's not business as usual. Uh, and uh, the technology transfer happens through people and the availability of well-trained people in the methodologies and the management of our DNI. And I think that's the central theme that we might discuss now in a few, a few moments. So my, my, my second last point is that uh, new innovation models as they emerge, they will impact on the RDNI ecosystem and on technology transfer. Uh, we know that the management of RDNI centers, uh, such as the gateways and of the technological universities, the EI, Enterprise Ireland Technology Centers, the SFI research centers uh, and other centers have very ambitious targets uh, also for industry income generation. Uh, these centers and other centers need to review their methods of interaction uh, with industry. Uh, and case studies, perhaps such as this one here with MinCon can act as valuable inputs to that. Uh, finally, to my, my last point, uh, digitalization of RDNI for real-time governance and management processes, they will play a critical role in going forward uh, and for achieving this step change. Uh, this is an aspect of digitalization that uh, I don't actually hear too much about. Uh, it's not spoken about as much as other aspects, but the digitalization of RDNI management uh, its significance is really not to be underestimated. Uh, and uh, MinCon and, and ReadyWatch are implementing a digitalized RDNI management system. So that's really uh, the, the uh, end of my, 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 the first part of this talk. I've summarized these, these take home messages there as I've just spoken about. Uh, and I very much look forward to the, dis the discussion now after this. And I now pass the word over to Joe Purcell, the CEO of MinCon. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jerry. I'm just going to request control there. And I approve. Do I, yeah? Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. yeah you got yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, man. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so just briefly take you through uh, a bit of a history of, of MinCon. Um, we started off in 1977. Uh, my parents, Paddy and Mary Purcell, started the business. Uh, I was 11 at the time. And I've worked in the business ever since in one form or another. Um, through the 80s, uh, we started, started designing and manufacturing our own products. Um, I finished a mechanical engineering degree in 1988. And uh, through the 90s, I moved down to Australia and was involved in product development for reverse circulation hammers for uh, exploration drilling for mineral exploration. Um, at, towards the end of the 90s, the business was struggling in Shannon. Uh, so we sold the, the business in Perth. We circled the wagons in Shannon and we uh, started developing a range of products to go after the, the, the water well drilling and geothermal heat pump well drilling markets in the US and Scandinavia. So in 99, uh, we were still a small company. We were turning over about 4 million euros. Uh, so through the, the, the noughties, we, we built the company up. And in 2012, we were turning over about 60 million euros, but we had a, we had a structural problem with the business. We couldn't go after big mining accounts because we didn't have the full package to go after those, after that business. We also had an issue where we had about 50% of our business was direct to the end user and 50% was through distribution. And in a lot of cases, the miners wouldn't deal with, uh, with, uh, distribution. They wanted to deal with original equipment manufacturers. So we decided in 2013 to do an IPO. Uh, we raised uh, a chunk of money to uh, basically develop the business through acquisition and organic uh, means. So since that time, we have uh, done acquisitions of manufacturing businesses. We've uh, done, we, we've acquired customer service footprint as well. So today, where we stand, we've got a, we've got a platform for growth. Um, we've added factories to the group. We've got nine factories around the world and an extensive customer service footprint. And today, 77% of the business we do is direct, uh, the balance through distribution. And we've more than doubled our turnover, but we're only getting started. Um, that's that's, that's the, the really the point I'd like to make. We're only getting started. Um, 
So, you know, the challenge in front of, of everybody is, is how do we minimize our carbon footprint? Um, you know, looking at MinCon, we're investing in new plant and equipment. We're currently going through a process and a, and a project to replace our heat treatment equipment in Shannon, which reduces the energy requirement of our heat treatment by 80%, uh, which is a big, big reduction. Our customers, uh, you know, if the world is to achieve its ambitions around carbon reduction, that means mining, you know, you need, that means copper, that means battery metals, that means iron ore. Um, so we need to be able to mine that in the most efficient manner possible. Uh, so our customers need better drilling systems, more efficient drilling systems. Uh, if you look, as Jerry mentioned there, we did get approved for a DTIF grant for uh, mooring of offshore uh, winds, wind installations. That's a, uh, that's a very exciting project, and I'll speak more about that later. We're also involved in uh, bespoke drilling packages for solar field uh, installations for anchoring of solar fields. So the challenge in front of us is to basically continually develop uh, the current range that we have today, continuous improvement, to develop new products, and also to look at new technologies, new technology development. So we have a, a team of engineers in, in Shannon, uh, and, and they're also, they also work with our engineering teams in, in, the, uh, in the manufacturing plants around the world. Um, we manufacture our prototypes, and then through our uh, customer service centers and our, and our field technicians, we get out with our customers, we test the products, and we get real-time feedback authentic real-time feedback, which is very important to inform us to, to, to go through the continuous improvement loops and, and make sure that we can deliver that really efficient system to the, uh, to the end user. So our three markets that we target today are mining, uh, construction, and water well geothermal. Mining is, 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 the, biggest, is the biggest revenue in, in, our, uh, in, in our revenue. It's 50% plus uh, construction is about 30% and water well geothermal is, is the balance. And our core technology is percussion. It's, it's basically drilling rock, but with, with percussion. And uh, that percussion can be generated by pneumatic compressed air or by the use of hydraulics. And th those hydraulic systems can be a closed loop system or they can be a flow through system. With the flow through system, we're using high pressure water. Um, and, and in the case of the subsea system, it's, it's a seawater powered hammer system that, that, that we use. So those, that's the core technology. And, and it basically it's our, our, our task to look at how we can deploy those core, core technologies to develop innovative solutions for our customers. And collaboration is an important part of, of, of what we do. I mean, we're collaborating with, with the guys at ReadyWatch and, and, and we work very closely with them on digitalizing our R&D uh, governance and, 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 and our leadership. It's, it's, it's very important to us. It's core to what we need to do. Um, and I think, you know, as Jerry mentioned, you know, basically we need to innovate. We need to innovate more and the effectiveness of our innovation uh, needs to be much, much greater than what it is. And, and I think we can do that. And I think we will deliver on, on, on what is a very ambitious um, R&D, uh, I suppose, development that we have in front of us. Looking at some of the projects we're, we're, we, we're very close to delivering, Green Hammer is one, it's a hydraulic uh, down the hole hammer. And this is basically being developed to replace uh, a system which is, which is, which is Pneumatic, pneumatically powered, um, and if you look at the fluid or look at the fuel consumption of the rig that you see on the right hand side there, that's about 150 liters of diesel per hour. We're drilling twice as fast as existing technologies with with this system, so that's a huge reduction in carbon. And as you know, the the, the diesel engines move towards using using hydrogen, which is where they where they think the future is going to go you still need to use that as efficiently as possible. So this is a big step forward for the hard rock mining industry. Um, this is another project we're involved with, and this is our large diameter, low pressure hammer. Uh, this drilled a successful, three successful uh, piles in Malaysia uh, just before Christmas. It was a 1.75 meter diameter hole. It's the largest hole that's ever been drilled with a single hammer before. And, uh, 
penetration rate they were getting with this system in granite was uh, three meters per hour. The rig that we use there was, is an 80 ton rig, sounds big, but that replaced a system, a pile boring system, which uses a 300 ton plus rig. It's a huge rig, enormous energy requirement to run it. And the penetration rate they get with that is about one to two meters per day. So this is a, again, a, a, a big move forward for, uh, for, for the drilling industry for construction applications. And then finally, the, uh, the subsea project that, that Jerry mentioned. Uh, if you think of the, the ambition that's out there towards uh, offshore wind installations, it's, it's enormous. One of the big challenges they need to do is how they're going to moor these things to the seabed. You need a very efficient way of doing it. We believe we, we're, we, we will develop a, a, a really nice, elegant solution for that. It's a seawater powered uh, self-drilling anchor system which would basically uh, drill and grout uh, anchor templates onto the seabed. The requirement for this is, is enormous. You know, the, the, the numbers are huge. And I think this is a very important uh, development, again, that's required for the rock drilling industry and for the offshore uh, installation industry. Over to you, Jerry. Yeah, so this uh, just the last slide, just to, to wrap up, conscious of the time. So I suppose, uh, based on, on what we've been saying, uh, we can see a, a kind of a structure uh, of a process coming out, a kind of a, a checklist for, you know, how to efficiently manage uh, the, the orderly and I in the company. Uh, and uh, uh, there's words there, real time. So managing uh, in real time. In other words, why is this happening, uh, documenting and recording uh, and uh, not subsequently. Uh, so that, that then also in, in, uh, interfaces with the digitalization of uh, rd &I management. So this would, would be a checklist. I'll just close off uh, this uh, here, uh, given the time, uh, and uh, really look forward to the discussion. Uh, uh, thank you, Joe, as well, for, for your uh, presentation as well uh, in this. Uh, and I'll close off now uh, and pass back to Orla. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry, and thanks also, Joe. Uh, so thanks to all for your presentations. And now let's uh, start to tease out some of the issues that you raised there. So we, we'll talk first in, in our virtual table here, around our virtual table, and then we'll bring in questions that come in in the Q&A. And again, very much encouraging people who have questions or comments to put them there in the Q&A box. So Jerry, I very much liked the slide that you finished on, which said, you know, what can my company do today? Because that's where I was going to begin. So if we look first of all in digitalization, this, you know, extraordinary transformation of, of the world in so many ways. And, and the fact that, you know, people working in various uh, industries have this wave of information and data now available to them. And, and in many cases, I expect struggling to understand how they can make sense of it and how they can secure competitive advantage off the back of it. So, so if you take an SME, for example, that knows that there is an enormous amount of data associated with their process, what steps should they be taking? I mean, you, you describe the steps that they're very broadly, Jerry, around, you know, or DNI capacity. Yes, Suppose yeah. someone wants to understand digitalization and how it applies in their business. What steps should they be taking in order to make sure they're making best advantage of digitalization? Mm -hmm. sure. And Jerry, or maybe Patrick or anybody like Mike might like to jump in on that. Yeah, if you like, I'll, I'll just say say one or two thoughts that come to mind straight away. Uh, I, I feel myself that uh, the uh, companies, particularly SMEs, uh, they uh, need to have uh, capability within the company. And given the scarce resource situation, uh, having capability uh, in digitalization uh, to a you know a strong capability there that that needs to be uh, I suppose uh, it, it does need to be acquired. Uh, and uh, so I think, uh, Orla, the, some of the uh, people coming out of the universities now, uh, you know, graduates coming out at master's and PhD level, and, but also very importantly, I think, coming out from the, uh, the centers for doctoral studies and training. So people who have a high level of understanding uh, of this uh, world of digitalization uh, with good training behind them, companies need them and they need them more and more and they're a very scarce resource. I, I might bring Patrick in on this one also. Yeah, I agree with, I agree with Sir there on what he's saying. Um, a lot of the times you're dealing with an IT 
person in a company, then you're dealing with an automation engineer who can basically convert the data to give to the IT person. But he's right in what he's saying to actually link those two there. There is a missing person that can utilize that data the best. Now, there is some companies that are coming up with platforms to, to utilize that, that information. Um, so like all our machines now are actually heading that way. They're heading towards digital, the digital world. The devices now all have data that need to be captured. It's what they do with the data that's useful and, and presentable to, to managers, to engineers, to, 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 to people in within those companies. And I, I'm reminded of a, a conversation that I had recently. This was a discourse at the Royal Irish Academy with Professor Sir, Sir Adrian Smith, who, among many other accolades, is the head of the Turing Institute, this very big data science institute in the UK. And he was making the point that data is now so pervasive in all domains that he would argue that everybody coming through a higher education system needs to know about data as it applies to their uh, sector because of course data science it's not the same as you know normal computer science it's not the same as software it's not the same as programming you know it, it is the science of understanding vast amounts of data so are we producing people out of engineering at the moment with that skill set not just in ICT but in data science anybody like to jump in on that Andrew yeah I'll, I'll take that I think um use of data analytics is a bit like teenage sex for me, Orla. It's uh, much talked about, but not an awful lot of it happening, really. The, the real challenge that we have from an Irish perspective, and, and indeed right across Europe, is access to these types of people. But not only that, when we're talking to SME owner managers or large multinational, uh, multinational executives and so on, you can have a conversation around automation. It's very clear. Here's what the automation piece does. There's your ROI. Away we go. If we look at additive manufacturing, same profile of conversation. If we look at something like um, environmental impacts and so on, same thing. Analytics is a much harder sell. It's difficult to clearly articulate what it is that this type of process approach can take in an individual level. We know data is the new oil. We know that the engagement and interrogation of data is going to be the next transformative journey that these organizations are going to have to take, not just, remember, within the four walls of their building. This is something we really need to get together on. It's not just about interrogating our own processes, machines, and so on, as Patrick said there, but all the way right down through our supply chain. It's no longer adequate to have the supply chain in a linear fashion with a digital thread. That's already uh, passe. What we really need to have is uh, AI type, type of interfaces that can pull across uh, the, the spare capacity in different environments and pull it out and articulate that into a value chain network, if you like, that will deliver uh, impact for the organizations themselves. And these are the types of ideas that can only be transformed by the flow of data, which is already being, which is still being impeded. We have this 5G network type capacities, but it's still not at a network level. We have them, you know, we've a lot of people saying, well, do I really need 5G? Will not high end uh, Wi Fi use me and so on? Those are the organizations that aren't pulling enough data out of their programs and so on. So there's a cell here at an individual level, but clearly there's a heavy cell. At, 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 a, at, a, at a systems level right across the supply chain. And if we look at organizations that are clustered together in areas like uh, Eindhoven, for example, in Southern Holland, where we have a large capacity of machine builders in the same way as we have a large capacity of um, medical device corporations in this country, they've already gathered those communities together and they're building infrastructures that make difference at that type of level. So we're, we, are, we are well behind the curve in this country in terms of where we need to be. The answer is no, we don't have enough of these people coming through. If they do come through, they're not coming to the manufacturing sector. They're going into Google and Facebook and you know places that are mining that at this level. And then we've got this whole idea of digital sovereignty, not just at an EU level or national level, at an organizational level. Do I own my own data? Is there someone giving me a machine, a machine and they own my data? So I don't even have the upside of the value proposition in that. So there's an extraordinary deficit here of understanding what it is we're talking about and then addressing the problem that we have uh, at a national level. And, and Andrew, what in your view are the key steps that we should be taking in the first instance to start to address these problems? 
Well, I, I think if we look at, you know, it's easy to blame the education structure. I have, I have two beautiful daughters. One is doing uh, musical theater because that's what she likes to do. And the other lady is in maths and applied maths and physics because that's what she needs to do or likes to do. We need to encourage more of these kids not to just come into our space in the general sense. We need more artists involved in mechanical engineering because that ideation is now possible through the, 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 you know, the types of technologies that we have. So the more people we can encourage into it, particularly young women coming into this because there just simply aren't enough. As you can see, looking at the names of the attendees that we have here, there's not enough women in that particular group. So that's something we can change. Uh, you know, that's something that needs to change specifically. Your, your colleague there that you mentioned, the professor around encouraging analytics and maths, we need to in, be able to interpret these types of technologies at a, at a manufacturing and a management level. We have people my age with gray beards that are in senior management roles in organizations, managing people who have a capability, a capacity and understanding of technology that we don't have and we're expected to manage that output so i think there's a that that deficit needs to be addressed now if i was to answer your question specifically in terms of the steps that we need to take we need to acknowledge it at a national school level acknowledge it at at, at, at our ty for example get more of these young kids into manufacturing environments seeing the types of technology we're going i'd love to take a, a gang of kids down to patrick's place down that's a beautiful looking organization in terms of with the wow factor for companies and and for irish mothers in particular and i i'm married to an irish mother have an Irish mother to, to see the types of roles and opportunities that there are there for young girls in particular in this in this particular field so all of this but it needs to be done at a national level where is the for example ty transition year student experience in manufacturing and industry where is that we've got kids going into ty they're goofing around in in, in national schools getting um, all sorts of you know experiences that are there why aren't they coming into our factories why aren't we they're coming into our our universities in the engineering departments why aren't they building stuff like they love to do when they're five years of age it's almost like a educational system has squeezed that out of them and all we want is healthcare manufacturers or healthcare engineers or our physiotherapists you know we need more people to see this as a viable option it's about numbers we need more people coming through the pipeline in order to get people out the other side jerry yeah, I see Jerry wants to come in just to, to throw in there as well. Obviously, Engineers Ireland and Engineers Ireland member volunteers do a huge amount to support transition year activities, and they do bring transition year students into industrial locations around about the country or they give them talks. So, so there, there are things that are happening, but, but clearly but not there's, enough. There's, there's no national program. Every school in this country, why does Solace give back up to 20% of its budget every year? Why isn't there a requirement? Why don't we give schools or these kids credits in leaving cert? If you've gone out and you've spent four months or two months or whatever it is, you'll get 10 or 15 points in your leaving cert. I'm not talking about the ad hoc stuff. We do a huge amount. I had four and a half thousand kids through my institute last year alone during COVID. I mean, it, we're all doing Trojan work at a hero level. We don't need that. We need a policy that comes in and directs it right into those schools, right into the sixth class kids, for example. So before they ever going to secondary school this is an option particularly for our girls where's the joined up thinking at a national level and that it isn't there the funding isn't there there's too much of the ad hoc stuff going on and I, that would be i'm not being critical of engineers aren't or indeed my own group or anyone else but there just isn't joined up thinking in that like you have for example in the german system and the italian system these are not we don't have to learn this from new we could just copy what's being done internationally Okay, so Jerry, you've been waiting to come in on that. Yeah, just, uh, I, I think I was back on the on the on the data side for a moment there. So uh, you know, this term, uh, big data. Uh, I think it's not about big data actually. I think it's about quality data. Uh, and uh, so we're seeing, uh, and through the uh, so some of the international research uh, that that I would be looking at, uh, that the uh, quality of data coming out, getting off the system, uh, and the, the sensor the inline sensor uh, and uh, you know, the robustness of the data that's coming. What we're, what we're seeing is with the, the digital twin development that's, that's, that's progressing really well, uh, but it, it's about quality data. Uh, and uh, so the technical uh, aspect of sensors, you know, getting the data uh, from the right place and knowing what you're getting. So uh, let's say thermal data is a really good example uh, or data on, on the pH values. Uh, these uh, sensors uh, need to move to yet another level uh, of capability in order to get to this quality data. So that's I just make that point as well. That's a challenge for us in, in, in advanced manufacturing systems to get the real quality data that we need. 
And Joe, I might bring you in on that one, because obviously your systems work in very, very noisy environments in all sorts of ways. So, so, so what do you find about the quality of the data that you're able to secure? Well, I think the most important thing is that it's reliable. Um, and, you know, that's one of the reasons why we were so keen to develop that direct to the end user uh, network. Uh, and, and, and it was a it was a big part of 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 building what 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 we've built and, and and the opportunity that's in front of us, so it's the reliability of that data, um, and then it's managing that data and it's managing the feedback loop from the customer face, you know, to, from from the rock face literally uh, yeah. back to the engineers and and then interpreting that data and then feeding back a better a better system, a more efficient system, um, and and it's. It's trying to, I suppose, there's a lifetime of engineering that, that some of us have had and it's bringing on the next generation and, and so that they can pick it up easier than, you know, we don't want that, them to go through all of the pain that we went through and it's, it's passing that knowledge on in a more effective way. And uh, certainly the, uh, you know, the, the system with, with, with Jerry, with, with, with ReadyWatch has, has, been, has been very good for that. And then bringing through, you know, new young keen engineers that, that actually want to work in, on these projects. Um, you know, that's that's so critical, and yeah. giving them giving them something that they can believe in. Uh, yeah. You know, and 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 get, putting a vision out there that you know that the world needs needs this reduction in carbon. It's so important, and 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 people can buy into that. Um, now. That's that's what we're doing. Uh, I think there's there's so much more that can be done to bring in that next generation. And 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 as and as Andrew rightly said, you know, we need to enthuse those people. We need to bring them through. Uh, it's 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 so important. Yeah. And and what's your answer to that question that I posed earlier about somebody say they're working in an SME or they're working in a company that doesn't have any tradition of of, of data science or data analytics within their operation but they feel that there might be an opportunity for them there. What's your advice as to how they can get to understand the opportunity and see how they might utilize it? Well, I'm biased. I'd contact Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And if Jerry is unfortunately unavailable, any other suggestions? Uh, not, not beyond that, no. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sounds like you've got a satisfied customer there, Jerry. Um, yeah, yeah, now, yeah, yeah. now, this whole area, so we're, we're talking about some of the challenges of, of this world of data and, and getting to grips with it and bringing it into companies, but it's also obviously an opportunity and one would expect it should be an opportunity for Ireland because, you know, digitalization is an area where we have a huge skill set nationally. Many of the big digital players are located in Ireland. We've got huge cohorts of people working in the digital sectors in Ireland. So, so, you know, one might imagine that this would be a natural one for Ireland to, to layer digitalization onto various sectors, including manufacturing. I'm getting a sense that we haven't yet quite cracked this so yet nationally. Yeah, I, I, I could come in there. I, yeah. I get to, 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 yes, we, we haven't cracked it nationally, but, but that wouldn't make us unusual at an international yeah. I think the world is, is struggling with this. To be very fair, um, our, our opening contribution there was from Leo Clancy, um, CEO of Enterprise Ireland. There's a massive amount of work going on in Enterprise Ireland to orientate SMEs. If I was not as lucky as Joe in having a, a, my partner already nailed down, I would certainly go and talk to John Durkin, for example, in Enterprise Ireland. There's huge amounts of help and support and people out there. That will that will do this. There's an enormous amount of technology centers, for example, you know, like I check in Data Hub and Data Value Hub above Manhattan, and um, ourselves in IMR, for example, we've got a digitization division. You know, the idea is that if it's horses for courses, there's help out there if you go and seek it. Uh, the Siri program that I mentioned there is to do an evaluation to give you that roadmap and it should point you in the direction that you need to be in in the context of it. It's baby steps. I, I don't if, if I was an owner manager looking at it now and I, I deal with 
hundreds of companies right across Ireland, indeed in Europe, on, on this particular challenge. I don't know that I narrow it down to, down to analytics or digitization or a subset of any. There's a whole pile of things around automation, for example. You've got a vision system um, that Patrick uh, mentioned there in his particular talk on design prone. They're building this type of equipment at an international level. That's basically taking visual data and bringing it back into an interface to look at it. We did a lovely project with Airbus in, in Spain and an SME in the Midlands called TEG. It was a, a smart Eureka program, 5 million euro project. Um, and it basically did a vision system that allowed them to scan using a collaborative robot the wing of an Airbus uh, airplane and you were able to determine when it needed to be maintained and so on. I think sometimes we can overcomplicate this idea of analytics. That's just it's exactly what analytics is. It takes the data from one particular environment and creates information that's of value to the person at the point of use. Um, you know, we do a lot of work with Tesla, for example, on light weighting. Again, it's analytics coming through and looking at what, what you're seeing in all of this. So, you know, I, I think you're right. There's a massive opportunity on this island. I'm I'm very positive. I I, I get frustrated when I, when I when you know when I when I look at certain elements of it. But you know we've got to acknowledge in in the Irish context that you know we we have a massive opportunity. We own an awful lot of the medical device corporations on this world. A lot of the pharma guys here, you know, all, most of the hip and knee joints are made in Munster. So we've got. We've got an awful lot of opportunity, as you say, to overlay this digitization project, but I wouldn't make it too complicated. I'd say, how do we get value out of our systems? How do we do it smartly? And how do we do it in a way that's coherent? And there's a lot of help from Enterprise Iron. And I should say the idea as well, there's an excellent group in there in innovation. I know Chantel Kieran, for example, a colleague of mine is, is, is in there doing a huge amount of positive work as well. So whether you're in a large corporation or small, there's help out there and reach. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So reach out for the help. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then not looking at the level of individual firms, but, but individual engineers. So suppose an engineer mid-career sees the, this opportunity, and, and I know I'm focusing on digitalization for now, and I'll, I'll move on to other topics shortly. So, so they know that this is out there, this is happening, they think it's going to be relevant to their industry. How do they upskill in this environment, or, or, or do they? Or do they, do they look to, to hire in additional capacity? Maybe, Patrick, I might put that one to you, first of all. Um, I suppose, that, look, we've started, um, there's, a, there's an apprentice course we've grown to Sligo IT, where we can take graduates um, where they work on the job and they also attend college as part of their, it's a three-year course. Um, they're starting to look at, I suppose, the smart devices where you're communicating uh, between the different devices. Um, so that's very useful to see. Um, we have three engineers in our place doing that. Um, so they're getting hands-on experience. Um, with regards to digitalization and utilizing it, like the, the best people that could go towards would be automation engineers. Um, but again, you probably see in, in job posts that the automation engineer is well sought after. Uh. Um, so there is definitely a lack of, of automation engineers in Ireland. Um, the role of the mechanical engineer has changed slightly. I don't, I don't think that courses are changing to suit the actual equipment that's now available. Um, I think the role of mechanical engineer is now, again, it has to move with the, the apps-based platform, the, the web-based platform. You're still going to need to design the, the gears, the structures, the, the weights, the movements and all that, but I think they're going to become more multifunctional in that they will have to look at the the programming side and the mechanical side. I think we need more engineers in that, in that point of view. So, so, so can we talk then about the talent pipeline? And again, I'm not just thinking now about the, the, the data element, but all the changes that we're seeing in manufacturing, in mechanical engineering. Um, so is the talent pipeline being formed uh, as it should be? Are there enough engineers? Do we need to look to you know di different skill sets and what we look for in our mechanical engineers and and, and if, if you know if there is a problem with addressing those needs through the current talent pipeline what do we need to do differently is it about attracting in more uh, mechanical engineers and, and we know all the difficulties are around that, that that have been outlined briefly already is it about attracting more into the country maybe from outside this country is it about changing the formation of engineers is it about bringing people from different disciplines more integrated into manufacturing 
what steps can we take nationally, do you think, to improve our talent pipeline in the space? Jerry, I might put that to you first. Yeah, I, I, I suppose uh, one, one thought that I have in the overall sense, uh, I think, you know, in, in just specifically in the area of manufacturing, we're in a much better position today uh, in many respects uh, to what we were even uh, five, six years ago. You know, we have, uh, you know, the, the technological universities in place. Uh, we have the uh, very strong research centers bringing through people as well and on the training side. And then the undergraduate programs, uh, all, uh, albeit the different universities have different flavors. Uh, but I think it's well recognized that the skill sets uh, for the mechanical engineer uh, have changed without doubt. Uh, I firmly believe that the fundamental sciences uh, are probably uh, more needed today than in the past. So the concept of giving, uh, you know, one, two, three years uh, on fundamentals, uh, mathematics and fundamental sciences, and then building on that in an applications area is a, is a strong concept for us uh, because, uh, you know, applications, as we see, change very rapidly, uh, but uh, the engineers have to be equipped with the fundamentals. Uh, so I think, and we can see evidence of that in the country as well. I, I would believe that we're actually on education of engineers uh, internationally, we're very, very strong, in fact. Uh, so I think that's a that's a that's a positive situation okay, uh, that we have in the country. But then uh, you can see that uh, you know th there's very definitely shortages of engineers. There's hardly a company that we go into that we don't hear about. They're looking mm. for uh, I, actually engineers, but technical people, uh, even at the CTO levels. You know, I'd say I know quite I, there's quite a number of companies that I'm aware of that are searching for CTOs and can't find them. So it's at different levels in the, in the, in the companies as well. Okay, but, but you think that, as you say, we're in a better position than we were five years ago. You think that the, the education that our, our engineers are getting is moving in, in, in response to the trends that we're discussing here? Well, well uh, I, I would say um, maybe uh, from some perspective, maybe not, uh, but I think the, you know, some of the programs that are happening uh, where students are placed in companies, uh, the industry placement programs for six months, uh, and you know th those sort of experiences are really excellent. Uh, excellent, you know. So it's, it's probably not ideal, uh, and uh, I suppose the challenge is that there's a convergence happening of of technologies, you know, uh, of, of sorry of disciplines. So we're converging mechanical with electrical with uh, le let's say software, uh, and also with biology now as well. Mm -hmm. So. so yeah. So our traditional channel, our traditional pillars in the universities uh, are not not ideally suited uh, to this convergence that that's happening. Uh, so uh, so uh, I'm not sure how we would deal with that at the, the university level. But uh, but the, I think you know within the system, uh, students do have the possibilities of getting experience in other disciplines other than their main core discipline of mechanical engineering. And, and then, of course, uh, another uh, aspect of talent formation that's very relevant to our topic here tonight is research. Uh, and you touched on that, Jerry, the formation of talent through research, which, as we know, is, is, is a key element of knowledge economies. I remember, Jerry, chat with you back in the day. There was almost no funding nationally for manufacturing research in Ireland. Now, that has changed in recent times. Mm -hmm. So is that working now do you think is is there still more to be done and um, what's your view of the landscape in terms of developing talent through research and manufacturing yeah I'll, uh, i mean I, I think i mentioned in my uh, in my seven minutes there uh you know the gateways that are in existence mm -hmm. yeah uh, and uh there's they're very close to industry as well uh and they've got targets i mentioned targets they've got very stringent targets uh, as have the SFI centers uh, to work closely with industry. Uh, so, you know, that, that interaction with industry is, uh, is certainly, you know, at least from my perspective, I see good strength in it, you know. Uh, it may not be ideal. And of course, the challenge is there's not enough. And so does it come back down to a numbers issue at the end of the day that we just don't have an adequate number uh, of engineers uh, available in the country, you know? I think that's... that's I and, and I, I'd like to ask Joe and, and Patrick, what's your experience of dealing with the research system nationally and, and how it meets your needs? And Joe, obviously, you you seem to be a, a satisfied customer. Yeah, I mean, we've we've had some good experiences. Um, I think, uh, you know, we worked with 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 DCU. Um, we're working with UCD and, and UL on this uh, on the DTIF project. 
and uh, there's a, it's a collaboration between ourselves and a company called Subsea Micropiles in Dublin. And uh, yeah, we've we've had pretty good pretty good experiences. And 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 then the co-op, the placement uh, side of things, we've we've had very good experiences there. Oh. And and you know we've been you know, maybe we've been lucky, but but <laughs> I don't think we've had a bad experience. So yeah. you know, and I think some of those uh, some of those students uh, we hope are going to join us um, when 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 they're finished. So I think that's that's been good. Um, I don't know, Patrick, what, what what your experience has been? Yeah, we've we've had um, co-op co-op students as well that has come into us for for their experience. Um, we should be doing more. <laughs> I feel mm. um, definitely with the local colleges. Um, I'd like to have to say that we could put an influence on the engineers that are coming out because I suppose being in Limerick, you can probably see there's a lot of companies now coming like Eli and Johnson Johnson are based here, Stryker. So there is big uh, medical companies down this side of the country. Um, so, and as well, they're all heavy manufacturers. They're, they produce a lot of components every year. And so the engineers that come out of college, they're if they were tended towards that, would get jobs very easily. Um, but again, uh, I kind of go back to the point before whether the, the engineers coming out are suited for their manufacturing environment straight away. I don't think mm. they are. Um, I think that the, some of the courses could be tailored to suit what's actually live out there at the moment. Um, I suppose how, do, how does anyone else feel on that topic? Andrew? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I. I struggle with this one at sometimes. I, I should say, and I don't mean this in any disrespectful sense, but I do a lot of work with a lot of countries at, at, at level. I've never come across a country that says their engineers aren't trained to an extraordinary degree and recognized at an international level. I think that's self-serving. We need some way of, of understanding what that actually means. In terms of how we approach um, our engineering training and so on, there's a question in there in the Q&A, which I think is reflective of my own conversation in terms of you know the fundamentals of what it means to be an engineer jerry is right absolutely bang on when he says that you know universities exist in our society to create third level thinkers into our society that's what they exist for not to create you know father for industry and the idea that we and our engineers are part of this that they can think that the ideation that they understand the cognitive reasoning and so on they need fundamental uh, parts and programs and bits and pieces to come together to be able to do that but this idea that a mechanical engineer is somehow sacrosanct and doesn't in any way interact with, I don't know, ballet dancers, for example, or, or, or artists and so on, that, that's a fluid sort of dynamic at this point. And our universities are beginning to shift it. You're seeing ever more types of things that a human being can engage with in order to create that value proposition for them. But Patrick has said it twice. He's not getting the type of engineer that he's looking for out of this system at any level, whether it's someone coming out of school that I train myself or someone that I'm getting put through, um, you know, the, the system from an apprenticeship program, for example, or the engineer I'm getting out of college uh, who has a degree and an attitude to go with it. And then, you know, the postdoc and so on that could come into this to, to this idea. So jury is correct in the context that that pipeline isn't full enough and that when they come out they're extremely scarce and then they're not able to do all things for all people so the challenge is do you say to your university sector well you should really be training people that understand how to how to build additive manufacturing units for example but if that technology changes you've got someone who's completely redundant so this this idea of that fundamental program and what that mix is and the idea that you've got programming as part of that is incredibly important because you're not going to build anything in the future world that isn't digitized and isn't sensorized and doesn't have data coming off. And if you don't understand that, then you're, you're as archaic as, as the mechanic who's trying to open the bonnet of a brand new BMW without the programming machine that goes into it. We've seen it right across every other sector and it's going to come from a manufacturing perspective as well. Um, and and I, would, I, it, I don't have a solution for it, Orla, but I do think it's something that, uh, you know, we're not any worse than any other country, but I think it's certainly not a soft problem, not by any means. Okay, and in terms of accessing the research expertise, something that we often hear from from companies is that they don't know how how and where to to get in and and, and to, to access 
the expertise. You've got all the universities, you've got the technological universities around the country. And for a company, and again, let's think of, of an SME, if they want to access a particular type of research expertise, that it is often difficult for them to find it. Now, there's been a lot of work done around the system, and for Zion and KTI, various people doing various things, SFI, to, to, to join up our expertise and, and make it more accessible to people. But are we yet where we need to be on this, do people think? I'd, I'd, I'd come in there again, sorry, just because I'm I'm in a research yeah. organization, so I suppose there's something that's close to my heart. Um, again, and I come to Joined Up Kinking, there are 48 different technology centers or gateways or programs or pro whatever you want to call them, different types of levels, whether SFI, IDA, Enterprise Ireland, and so on, 48 on an island this size. Every one of them has a PR and marketing department. That's a huge amount of noise. Um, and instead of figuring out at a national level what we want to do in a coherent way and say, look, these are the pillars that we should be going after and properly funding these, we've got all sorts of things that are happening in the system make very little sense. We have a dairy centre, a milk centre, you know, an agri-business centre, and, and they're all different. You know, I wonder if I was an SME trying to figure this out, I find it very, very difficult. And a Technopolis report from 2015 told us that we need one centre of manufacturing at the moment. And we've proliferated this into multiple options to suit different funding entities in the state. Uh, and it all, it all comes from the same department. So I think if I was looking at this, there's an incoherency across, right across the spectrum. How do you engage with this? There's no one portal that says, this is the type of problem I have, and this is the place that I need to go in order to get it. And if I do a project, for example, with, I don't know, Jerry Byrne there with or, or, or someone else, and I want to take that project to a higher TRL level, for example, I want to add... I want to add a materials element to it. I have to have an IP agreement with two different entities. There's no sort of end-to-end -end coherency there. And Jerry mentioned that SFI centers are encouraged to work with industry, which is a great idea in, you know, in theory, but you know, we've got a fundamental basic research organization in terms of where it sits at a TRL level, purporting to do work at, at a high TRL level and at almost a commercial level with an organization. That makes no sense from an execution perspective and certainly isn't what fundamental research is, for example, in the German model or in the Dutch model or in the, or in the British model, or you know, pick a country and you'll see a coherency in terms of how they, dis, they, they, they discern between these entities. So it, it's a massive problem. And, and I think you know, that, that's one element, where do I go? Then when you turn around, you look at how does an organization engage with this? If I was a, an Italian SME, for example, any piece of equipment that I would buy off Patrick, I could write off completely against my tax liability over three years. Can't do that in the Irish system. If I, if I want to borrow uh, 1 million euros uh, from any investment entity here from a, you know, a European investment bank and so on, uh, it's the equivalent of $3 million of borrowing from, from a German SME. That's not a level playing field. And all of the mechanisms are, are you know, you mentioned earlier, or I, I couldn't agree with you more, this idea that we're an island economy. We have enough things going against us to be creating that kind of noise in this system and not allowing these SMEs to have those opportunities to engage with this high-end technology. And again, we're very good at the PR. We talk about, oh, we've got this center for that and that center for something else. But where's the coherency right across the board? And I think, I, 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 as I said, I, I don't want to hug the, 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 the microphone here in this one, but I think it's that we're a long way from starting this problem. Yeah. Here, I might bring you in on this. Yeah, I, I uh, you, you'll have see, heard my presentation talking about this uh, step change uh, and I showed some organizations there. One of them was the OECD. Uh, the OECD did a study, I think, two or three years ago in Ireland on SMEs and uh, they uh, concluded that the productivity levels uh, in SMEs in Ireland are behind the curve. We're not as, uh, as advanced as, as we should be. Uh, the, the OECD uh, is uh, an interesting organization. I think there might be 35 countries that are members, but actually, uh, and very few at least I, I hear it said very, uh, I don't hear it said very much that the OECD actually uh, are, uh, you know, their, their guidelines are being used as we speak in Ireland uh, for R&D. Uh, so the, the revenue, uh, when they implement or when they check for, uh, for the tax credits, then companies have to live up to the standards of the OECD under the Frescati manual. Uh, so we are actually implementing the uh, OECD standards in Ireland. Uh, and if companies don't succeed in, uh, in demonstrating that they are at that level, which includes a state of the, an international state of the art, uh, then, uh, then it's a problem for the company. Uh, so I, I think that that's, there's certain elements of the system that I think need to be uh, considered and maybe joined up a little bit better, that the, the, the Irish, the ecosystem 
or or the NI as linking to companies. Uh, there are elements in there that I think could uh, could be looked at and could be improved. And that OECD example is one of them that that I, I can see very clearly as we're working with companies. You know, if they're putting in a tax credit, they have to meet what they call, refer to as qualifying R and D. Uh, so the people have to be trained in that. So I think the the training element would be very useful. Also coming through when uh, young researchers are being trained, it's useful for them to be trained in some of those aspects as well. I, I'm wondering, Orla, whether is it valid to say that the OECD standards are top international standards? Since oh yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Since they're global standards, and if yeah. we're implementing that through revenue, then we should recognise that. I think. You know? Yeah. And yeah. um, before we wrap up with the round table, and then obviously I'm going to, to turn over the questions. I just see two questions at the moment in the Q&A. So, so anybody else who wants to get their question in, there's plenty of capacity there. And um, we haven't yet talked in our round table here about sustainability. And um, obviously digitalization is one of the huge global trends. Uh, another is sustainability and the sustainability imperative. So, so is that going to transform Irish manufacturing? Is it going to threaten Irish manufacturing? Is it an opportunity for Irish manufacturing? Joe, I might bring you in first. Obviously, you've given us a great example from your own company, but what do you think about Irish manufacturing more broadly and where we are positioned on the sustainability curve? I think it should transform it. I mean, the, the opportunity is vast. It's, it's, it's enormous. Um, and, you know, you think about, okay, we're, we're, we're doing a piece of, 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 the, of the offshore um, installation work but but i mean all all that all that goes with that is is a vast opportunity and you know you think about today uh you know even steel manufacture um you, you know there, there's there's the traditional view that it needs to be done in an area where you know you, where you're producing massive quantities of steel i think there is an opportunity for small scale steel manufacture in ireland and that may sound daft but i believe that um, you know, you think about uh, the the requirements that's going to come for you know just vessels, uh, the amount of vessels that are going to be needed for the offshore work, uh, the port infrastructures, the construction work. Um, I, I, I think I think the opportunity is vast on, on that alone. Um, and and you know, I I for one am very excited by that as a uh, as, as an opportunity for Ireland, Ireland Inc. You want to call it that? Um, I think it's it's uh, it's it's huge, and it should be it should be recognised, and, and it should be it should be really grasped because uh, because it's it's not going to hang around. You know, other countries are going to mm. pick up the pick up the the, the, the ball and run with it, um, but we seem to be uh, tied up in a loop of of trying to figure out our planning permissions on on these on these offshore. Uh, installations and and we need to get ahead with it because it's it's a huge it's a huge uh ambition that the country says it has uh but to actually deliver on it is uh, is a whole other story but so, i think so, it's great and, and that's an interesting point because we were talking earlier about when we were talking about digitalization we, we seem to be focusing in on the talent pipeline as maybe the biggest threat there or the biggest obstacle the biggest challenge you're talking in sustainability that it might be planning or infrastructure, you know, yeah. that it's these aspects that are the problem rather than the talent pipeline there. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Okay. I think I think I, I I personally think that the current generation wants to uh, get its hands dirty, roll up the sleeves and get involved in, in, in these in these projects. You know, they, they really do. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, I believe we need to give them that opportunity um, because because it's there. It's real. And uh, and I think it's 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 an opportunity for the ages. You know, it's, it, this is this isn't a once in a generation thing. This is a multi generational opportunity. Um, but of course, I'm biased. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. And anybody nice. else like to come in on this one about you know what, what we need to do to grasp the sustainability imperative, Jerry? It just uh, uh, this morning I had a discussion with a, a company that make power units, uh, and uh, they were saying that. Uh, steel manufacturer, large steel uh, steel uh, company in Europe, uh, uh, you know, have informed them that they're changing to hydrogen. You know, mm -hmm. uh, so if they want to deliver their power units in, uh, the steel companies will have uh, presumably will have quite a, a, an amount of hydrogen available to them. So they would yep. expect that their power units will be uh, hydrogen powered. So if the company is not watching very carefully, 
uh, then uh, they could be out of business. So, so it's uh, there's a uh, you know there's a need uh, to uh, be very much on the ball. Let's say uh, in terms of what's happening uh, with the OEMs and uh, you know for their for their particular product, what are the threats? What are the op- there's huge opportunities, Joe? I fully agree with that. Mm. But I think there are also threats that are uh, out partially at least outside of the control of the company. Uh, that would be an example with the hydrogen. So, so the the company needs to respond very early. Uh, so, so does does that element I think as well to to, uh, to I suppose to have a sustainability plan uh, and to in that plan to identify what the threats would be as well. That's mm. yeah. Okay. Andrew, yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry, just to come in on that, uh, Jerry's right, and, and I guess this is a lovely example in Europe of, of the state infrastructure working with with the, with people in the commercial zone, so the, the group that you're talking about looking at liquid hydrogen, or sorry, hydrogen and low carbon hydrogen and so on coming into that, um, is being supported by, you know, changes in GBER, for example, uh, that are coming down the track from the Commission mm-hmm. at the moment, so there's one arm going with the other. In terms of, of sustainability and circularity, um, really important from a manufacturing perspective, this won't be done without manufacturing, you know, so this idea yeah. that, that, you know, we're in the middle of this, it's a massive opportunity, a huge, I, it really drives me nuts when I hear about penalties to do with environmental, it's not about penalties for doing the wrong thing, it's about benefits commercially for doing the right thing, you could make yeah. an awful lot of money if you get this right, and when Joe talks about the next generation, bang on i've got two teenage daughters and all they talk about all the time is green planet sustainability this has been driven down our throats so our generation didn't get this right and this next generation is not going to get it wrong so i think uh, and, and there's nothing but nothing but opportunity i mean joe's bang on there in terms of an opportunity from an irish context i'd be i'd be thrilled what we can do on this island i think we can we can be a global leader here really can. okay very good and patrick anything you'd like to to say on the sustainability question I think I'll, I think I'll um, refrain from that one. Uh, okay. It's, it's just a very really different as a group. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, there's there, there's a huge there's a huge requirement for automation in 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 this space as well. Um, it's it's massive, um, and and that that automation is is at so many different levels. Um, I think it's it, it's it's joined up thinking is is what's needed, um, and and I think you know, I think Patrick, you 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 have you would have a hell of an opportunity i believe um and anyway okay sorry. okay so we've got some, some very interesting questions coming in now so, so so let me start to go through some of them with you question from barry low what lessons do you feel we can learn from the irish experience over the last 20 years with implementing lean in manufacturing when looking at how best to have irish companies embrace digitalization should companies expand their lean program to include digitalization or do you see it as a separate initiative? Anybody like to uh, to take that one? Andrew? Yeah, yeah. yeah. happy to take it. Um, there's very little point in digitizing a bad process. So, you know, the fundamentals of manufacturing have got to be gotten right. So lean is a fantastic baseline in order to do it. Um, I do think, you know, I've seen organizations might sound daft who have gone almost too lean. Do you know what I mean? And that there's no fat at all on the, on, on the animal trying to do and pivot and, and move as it needs to do. I don't see them necessarily as completely separate. Um, I, I do think that it's an, it's, an, it's an elongation and development. I think, again, if we go back to Enterprise Iron, you look at Lean Start and Lean Transform, you see Digi Start, Digi Transform. So there's clearly at a national level uh, encouraging SMEs to go on a journey, if you like, and work your way through that process into that transformation level. They're using the same nomenclature and so on. So for me, uh, I, I think Lean is a really important part. You, you really need to understand your process and eliminate some of the stupid stuff that, that's in there, waste of all types, people, movement, process, materials, etc. And once you've done that, then you should be in a much better place to transform um, digitally, I would suggest. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Anyone else like to come in on that one? whether digitalization should be an expansion of lean or whether it should be separate. Anyone? Okay, if not, I'll uh, move on to another question. Oh, uh, I've seen in many companies, the lack of an RDI research de- development innovation champion. It, the question was put to Andrew, but maybe I might put it to Jerry in the first instance. Uh, wh- when your organization engages with companies, who are the key stakeholders usually involved? So Jerry, I might start off with you on this one. 
Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the um, the question of an R and D champion, I suppose, the experience that we've had over a, a good number of years uh, is that uh, if there isn't an R and D champion, uh, and it's uh, let's say sitting, uh, the the R and D is sitting, just for example, in the engineering department. Uh, if the champion is not there, uh, what we find is that it's very uh, engineering companies almost by definition are extremely busy. Uh, so it's hard for uh, somebody in the engineering department to, to undertake a, a role of championing uh, R&D. Uh, so what we have seen is a distinct step change uh, once an R&D champion is appointed into companies. And if those champions uh, have uh, been through uh, a process where they understand the methodologies uh, of, or, of research and development and innovation, uh, and uh, you know they, they know what's what's behind the scene in that in that regard, and maybe know the the ecosystem. That's a huge plus in developing the or the or the and I in in the companies. Anyone else like to come in on that one? Joe, for for example, from the the industry point of view. Yeah, I mean, I it's 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 something that I've been involved in all my working life, and and you do need that champion, um, and and. You know, you need to keep your eyes out for like-minded people, um, and, and to bring them in, and 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 to bring them in to mentor the next generation. Um, you do need absolutely. It's without that, you're, you're going nowhere, um, and and you need to you need to know it when you see it, and 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 if you can bring it on board, well then do so. Um, it's 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 vital. It's absolutely vital. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. Next from Richard Stokes, what does the panel think about how much real research is being done in Ireland in manufacturing fundamentals as distinct from process optimization? Is it mainly D and not R? Um, Jerry, you talked about the importance of fundamentals. So do you mm -hmm. want to maybe kick off with this one? Yeah, just to kick off there, the, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, I'm not so sure what the meaning of real research is, uh, but uh, you know, if you cl classify it according to the TRL scale, then the basic research uh, how much of that has been done uh, in, in manufacturing, so the low TRL, uh, and uh, I, I would answer not enough, uh, but certainly uh, there, there, you know, there's uh, very large numbers, in fact, of doctoral students in manufacturing research. If you go across, look across the country, uh, so there is uh, uh, there, there is fundamentals happening. Uh, it's not on the scale that we might see in in other countries. Uh, but it is happening. And then as Andrew very rightly made the point, uh, it's a little bit diffuse because uh, it's uh, a requirement of funding uh, to actually undertake work with companies and to have income generation for companies as well. So that moves it up a little bit up along the TRL scale, which you could argue is very positive. Uh, but from the point of view of developing the longer term uh, blue skies fundamentals that we will need in the plus five year scenario, it's not, it's not strong for that. Uh, so uh, to, to answer the question there, uh, Richard, um, the, the, uh, I, I would feel myself that there's, uh, you know, looking at it through the lens of industry, uh, it's primarily uh, a development and primarily experimental development work. Uh, and then uh, to a, a good, a lesser degree, uh, the, uh, the more basic low, low TRL uh, research. Anyone else want to add anything to that? I'd, I'd um, yeah, Andrew. I'd, I'd very much agree with Jerry. He's dead right. We've lots of PhDs out there, diverse, dispersed. Um, but but I think that the tone of the question is really, you know, and I'd, I'd use the term real myself, and I don't have the correct nomenclature to to to, to quantify it and so on. Um, if we look at New Zealand, for example, it gets about a quarter, if not if less, than the FDI that we get here. It's a small island, same number of people as ourselves on the edge of a large continent, just as we are, etc. It gets three times higher rate of R and D funding from large multinationals than we do. So, so there's something there's something not quite right in terms of the profile of of our uh, of FDI investments that we have in this country. So I, I think it's a well asked question. I don't think. Yeah. As Jerry said, I don't think it's enough. Um, and I think for the level of, of manufacturing that's going on here, it's certainly a failure in terms of in terms of the amount of research in the R sense that's being done. Now, we are doing quite a lot of developmental research in manufacturing, but really in that context, you're changing manufacturing processes and manufacturing from 
a spreadsheet perspective. Um, you know, if, if there's a CFO looking at manufacturing, they see it as a cost center. So it's not very lucrative in terms of the investment that multinationals in particular are willing to put into, uh, uh, into an organization. It's very often, you know, the marketing department would have a bigger budget in that context. So I, I think it's something that I know the idea, for example, you know, that, that Martin Shannon has, has spoken about this, the public setting, I've spoken to him about it myself. It's, it is a challenge, uh, but it's something that, that the idea are very focused on going forward. So hopefully we see a change. Okay, thanks, Andrew. A few, few more questions then to, to, to cover. Um, do the speakers believe that government should be value propositioning a task force to overview our industrial requirement in infrastructure? And this is to aid sustainability. Uh, Joe, wh what do you think about this? You, you talked about infrastructure challenges around our sustainability opportunity. Um, do you think there should be a, ta a government task force around this or, or, or what, what do you think should be a national step to start to address this? I suppose yes is the answer. Um, I've, I, I tend to steer clear of, 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 of government and all of that. Yeah, but, right. but I mean, yes, like, you, you know, the, the, there needs to be joined up thinking, absolutely. And, and, and the best place to drive that is, 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 is at a government level, uh, without a doubt. And, and it should be done. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank, th thanks, Joe. Question then from Dennis Dowling. With increasing uncertainty for manufacturers with respect to issues such as energy, raw materials, skills, etc., how resilient is manufacturing in Ireland, particularly given our dependence on foreign direct investment? Who would like to take that one? And I can only speak from our own point of view. And, and, and you know, Dennis is right. You know, raw materials, uh, all... all all of those aspects of, of manufacturing, you know, the supply chain around that, it's it's absolutely vital. Um, and you know, from a just a, a very small example, but but with, with very big consequences, Brexit has caused huge issues. Yeah. Um, you know, we we have a plant in in Sheffield that produces tungsten carbide inserts for our drill bits. We used to they, they used to stick it on a truck. On a Thursday, it'd be with us on a Friday, or a Tuesday, be with us on a Wednesday. Now it takes ten days, um, and that's that's yeah. a disaster. Um, yeah. And that's and that's on top of all the other uncertainties that are that are out there. So you just need to manage your way through that, um, and 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 build that resilience, and, and build a resilient supply chain. Um, and that's that's about relationships with with with, with suppliers and continually working on that. Uh, there's no other way to do it, and and. And, and in, in our case, we, we have big stocks of raw material. Um, you know, that's, as far as I'm concerned, that's money in the bank. Uh, rather have it on the shelf so we can turn it into something than, uh, than be sitting waiting for it. Um, and, and, and that, <laughs> you need a balance sheet to be able to support that then. Uh, yeah. You know, so it, it's, it's, not, it's not easy, but, uh, but that's, that's the only way forward. So maybe it's a, Maybe it's a situation where, you know, at government level, it, 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 it says to the banks, well, look at working capital loans and, and, and you know, things like that to try and, and build the balance sheets of, of, of the companies. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's a challenge. Yeah. OK, I'll try and wrap up fairly quickly now because we're, we're, we're coming close to, to half past eight. And Patrick, I might put a, a, there are a couple of questions at the start here that, that we kind of then did, I think, touch on, but maybe you might like to comment more on them. One of them was, where do you see the future role of the mechanical engineers? There seem to be plen plenty of future jobs in robotics, pro programming and automation. Is it in materials? And then another question, are programming capabilities becoming a new fundamental for engineers instead of a lot of traditional topics? So anything, Patrick, that you'd like to add on that? Yeah, I think, I think the role of a mechanical engineer is, is diversifying. Um, I can give you an example. We've, we've, we've done a machine recently for uh, a UK company where the mechanical build of the machine was the quickest we've ever done because all the devices on it were programmable. Um, so and a lot of the time, your mechanical engineer could program some of the devices on it. And in your automation engineer, they would link a lot of them together. And um, so I think, yeah, definitely the role is changing of a mechanical engineer in, in our sector and anyway, in the automation side. Yeah. OK, and um, thanks very much, Patrick. A question from Ramesh. Well, it's, it's largely a, a comment, Raghavendra. Um, 
of late MNCs and large companies are luring the staff away from small companies, SMEs and gateways by offering them significantly higher pay packages because of the shortage of skills in the economy. So, so Ramesh is worried that whether technology gateways and research centres and small companies can hold on to their staff due to the huge disparities in salaries and is this good for the economy? Anybody like to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I would comment there that it's very definitely a real problem uh, for SMEs uh, and, uh, you know, so there's a lot of mobility uh, happening there and it is very difficult for SMEs to retain staff when salary levels, in some cases you hear of doubling of salaries, you know, yeah. this is very significant, uh, you know, uh, uh, I suppose opportunities for young people. Uh, and uh, so I, th I think that that is, that is very definitely, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a massive uh, challenge for, for the, particularly for the, the SME sector. Yes. Um, thanks, Jerry. A question from John Coleman about the advantages of innovation, obviously enabling people to carry out tasks they better they previously could not or to achieve things they couldn't do before. But innovations also carry risks. Um, with the speed of change and innovation today, how does manufacturing ensure that risk is minimized? Andrew? All the IMR. Uh, uh, we're, we're there to de-risk it and de-risk it uh, for you. We have the largest cobotic lab in the country. We've got the largest uh, additive 3D metal printer made in the country. We've got the largest VR lab in the country. Come in, try the toys, use your product, use your services. It's not just us. I form above in UCD, for example, and Seam down in Waterford and all those uh, organizations they're, they're here to help and enterprise ireland and the idea have well if it's smes in this context have um de-risking uh, and levers funding to help you do exactly that but you have to take the step i mean if you think that your organization can stay on the same track it's on now and be and exist as it is now in 10 years time you're you're out of your mind look what look at uh, joe Purcell has done with his family's company there and the transformation that's occurred that didn't happen by you know steady she goes and keep going and not trying new things and so on you've got to take that is risk that's what business is uh, but ultimately we're building towards a better economy mm -hmm. And then our final question is, is along those lines also in the case of startups or small businesses developing products which are not focused specifically on sustainability or digitalization, are there organizations they can talk to which could advise how those elements could be added to their offerings? So, so you've, you've touched, Andrew, on a number of those. Um, anything else that anyone would like to add? Or is it the same grouping that we've talked about before? Yes, and, and Enterprise Ireland as well was was spoken of there, uh, the, the, the specific services that they offer in this regard. And, and Leo, I guess, as well, there's a lot of angel groups out there that are looking to help startups in particular. Okay. Um, but again, a, a lot of a lot of support, county enterprise boards, for example, for companies less than 10 people are very, very good at explaining the entire ecosystem. Uh, there's mentorship programs that are out there, the state funds on an ongoing basis. Um, and again, even small entities can get involved in research activities if they want to prove out, for example, they can work with any college or any tech university in the country using a model like an innovation voucher, for example, where you can get 5,000 euros worth of activity done for no cost to the individual or the organization themselves. So there's lots of ways of, of helping companies, regardless of the size and scale that they have. Um, uh, and like I said, reach out, the help is there. Okay. Or Thanks, uh, Andrew. If I could yeah, Jerry. Just a quick comment there. It, it, it links back to uh, some of the questions that we've had uh, in regard to resilience. I think I'm not sure who it was who asked that question. Uh, maybe it was Dennis Downing. Yeah. Uh, but you know what I what, what I was saying about uh, the complexity. Uh, I showed that on on the on the y-axis that that uh, uh, that uh, industry uh, one two three four diagram, uh, and uh, I see very much a link. I see the. Our, our systems becoming uh, increasingly complex. As I mentioned, additional complexity now with the, uh, uh, the societal elements and the sustainability elements coming in. So it's de dealing with complexity uh, for resilient systems. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, what better types of people uh, could be put on the job there to, uh, than good engineers, uh, you know, cross-discipline uh, engineers uh, so I think, uh, you know, our system uh, and, and we're seeing, I think, good responses of students coming into engineering as well at the moment in, in, in many disciplines. Uh, so I, the, the one big regret that I have at the moment 
is that I'm not 25 or 30. Yeah. I, th I, think, I think there's never been such an exciting time mm -hmm. in, in engineering uh, as yeah. I just currently see. Uh, so just, just to okay. tune on that point there, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well and I, and I, I might just put one final question, if you can just give me a quick answer off the top of your head. Suppose you had a magic wand and, and you could enact one step, one thing to, to help Irish manufacturing or, or, or to future proof us or to enhance our competitiveness or our innovation capacity. And what, what would you like to do if you had this magic wand? Get rid of the planning management. restrictions for offshore. <laughs> okay, that's Joe's. <laughs> My one would be, I would like to see, uh, I suppose, if you look back, we did have technology management that uh, Enterprise Ireland uh, uh, funded back in the, in the 80s. And there was masters of MSCs in, in technology management. In the management of technology, I'm seeing a big deficit. So I'd like to see good, strong supports for, for the management of technology, management of innovation and R&D. OK, thanks, Jerry. I, I, would, I would go back to Plato's Republic. He gave us a number of options thousands of years ago as to how to run society. One of those democracy. Another one was a benevolent dictator. And I think there is a requirement for a benevolent dictator to come in here and force some of the alignments that we need on the Irish system from the primary schools all the way up to the colleges and right through to the uh, all of the, the piece that we've got. All the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle are here, but all of them are acting independently and we're not getting it tied together. And some countries like Denmark, for example, are the same size as ourselves, five million people have done this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I should be able to do part of my PhD in Limerick and part of it with Jury and part of it up with Una Parsons and Sligo. And that should be coherent and, and absolute as they can in other countries. And we've, we, we're not doing that. So that's what my magic wand would do. Make me king so that I can make all that happen. Oh, so you're going to be the benevolent dictator. Of course. Don't yeah. think Plato oh. specified that, did he? It can, yeah. only, it, can only, it can only work. It can only work if I'm in charge. You know? <laughs> okay. In, interesting insight, Andrew. Yes, thank you. Um, and uh, Patrick. I'll vote for you. <laughs> Don't think we get to vote. <laughs> you won't. Uh, I'll, second, I'll, I'll second that. <laughs> oh, I, I think well, what Andrew was saying there is actually very prevalent. Um, I think it has to be a, a combined effort. Um, and we, on the topics we discussed tonight, we spoke about digitalization and research and development. And I think there's a lot of collaboration work that could be done there. Um, and also just on, I suppose, the upper where I see, and I mentioned it twice already, it's just, the, I suppose, getting the right people to for your jobs and increase the talent pool on equipment, on manufacturing and automation. Very good. All right. So listen, thanks all very much for your time and your expertise. I think it was a very lively and interesting discussion. And, and, and thanks to, to all who attended this evening. Thanks, of course, to Dermot Cowie and, and Connor Sheehan for, for arranging. Thanks to Maureen the Angusser for supporting. And um, I, I think there have been some very interesting topics raised. And, and I hope that we can take them forward in through Engineers Ireland or through whatever other fora are the right place to discuss them further. So thanks very much all and good night. Thanks, sorry for having Thanks, me. folks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.